Look back on the man who gave up the throne for the love of a woman. Next, as we recall Edward VIII, A King's Story, on TLC Presents. The duty of a king is to serve. The duty of a king is to lead. Almighty God, to call to his mercy our late sovereign lord, King George V, of blessed and glorious memory, that the high and mighty Prince Edward Albert Christian George Andrew Patrick David is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful lead, Lord Edward VIII. <clears throat> By the grace of God, of Great Britain, Ireland, and the British dominions beyond the sea, King, Defender of the Faith, Emperor of India, God save the king! The occupation of a king is his people. The burden of a king is his solitude. in France, home of a royal prince born to the mightiest crown on earth, now a private citizen. His sole dominion, a few acres of French soil, where only English flowers are allowed to grow. Prince Edward, King Edward, once ruler of the strongest empire the world had ever seen, counting his people by the hundred million, acknowledged king and emperor in all five continents. A monarch faced with one of the most terrible decisions ever to confront a human being, heir to a thousand years of sovereignty, who gave up all for the woman he loved. To whom, after the storm, his mother, Queen Mary, wrote, You will remember how miserable I was when you informed me of your intended marriage and abdication, and how I implored you not to do so. While sympathizing with your distress of mind at the time, I fail to see that your marriage has altered the point of view which we all then took up, or that it is possible for you both to come to England for a long time to come. 
Naturally, I am very sorry not to see you, as my feelings to you as your mother remains the same. And our being parted and the cause of it grieve me beyond words. The feeling about your marriage is far deeper and wider than you seem to realize, and your return to England would only mean dissension and controversy. Ever your loving mother, Mary. Prince Edward was born at White Lodge in Richmond Park, near London, on the 23rd of June, 1894. Queen Victoria had acquired a great-grandson. He weighed eight pounds. His father, later to become King George V, made a note of it in his diary. At 10 o'clock this evening, Mary gave birth to a sweet little boy. I imagine this was the first and last time my father was ever inspired to think of me in exactly those terms. England could rejoice, but through the cheering pierced one non-conformist voice. The fiery radical Keir Hardy, father of socialism, said in the House of Commons, The assumption is that the newly born child will be called upon someday to reign over this great empire. In due course, he will be sent on a tour around the world, and probably rumors of a morganatic marriage will follow. And the end of it will be that the country will be called upon to pay the bill. No one can deny that in many ways Keir Hardy's prophecies about my life were uncomfortably accurate. The child was named after his grandfather, two great-grandfathers, and the patron saints of England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. I name thee Edward, Albert, Christian, George, Andrew, Patrick, David. I have changed my name seven times in my life. I was born Prince Edward of York. I then became Prince Edward of Cornwall and York. I then became Prince Edward of Wales. I then became Duke of Cornwall. I then became Prince of Wales. I then became King Edward VIII. And now I'm the Duke of Windsor. The succession to the throne was now secure through four generations. The reigning monarch was the mighty Queen Victoria. She reigned for 64 years. And I always remember that whenever my mother, years after, it was just, I mean, just before she died, she always referred to Queen Victoria as the Queen, as if there had never been any other. Nor would there ever be another quite like her. Victoria was 18 when she was crowned in Westminster Abbey one summer's day in 1838. A young girl, but with a will of iron. No other woman had ever held such power. None would again. She set her stamp upon an age. The Victorian conscience sent missionaries and explorers deep into steaming Africa. The Victorian sense of order sent bayonets to the Himalayas and beyond. Victorian industry blackened the sky with smoke, and Victorian commerce poured goods across the seven seas. It was the age of certainty. Doubt was for foreigners. The great queen's favorite house was Osborne, on the Isle of Wight in the English Channel. Here she found happiness with her husband, Albert, Prince Consort, and their nine children. In the 24th year of her reign, Prince Albert died. Victoria mourned him for 40 years in deepest black. Whenever she could, she returned to Osborne, to the shadow of his presence. Night after night, she kept a journal, like a letter to the dead. Grief was her private companion. In public, she was the soul of majesty. When Prince Edward was born, Queen Victoria had been on the throne as long as most of her subjects could remember. For a while, the young prince lived with his parents in an apartment in St. James's Palace in the heart of London. But the prince's grandfather and father were countrymen at heart. They loved Sandringham, set in the rich meadows of Norfolk. There was good shooting there, and plenty of room for a man to breathe the clean country air. Grandfather, heir to the throne, lived in the big house. Father, when he married, had to make do with a bachelor's cottage on the banks of a lake nearby. 
Here the young prince was joined in time by his brother Albert, his sister Mary, and three more brothers, Harry, George, and John. The growing family had a housing problem. It was a very, very uh, congested, and you know, father and mother, there were six children. There was a lady-in-waiting, there was aides, and a tutor and a governess. And uh, we all got in with a, with a shoe lift, almost. The children's favorite haunt was an island inhabited by a stone pelican. It was a very wise old bird, but uh, sometimes we used to put funny hats on its head, which was not very popular, which was not very popular or approved of. Approval or not, Sandringham was home. Osborne was something else. Osborne was formal bronze and formal stone, and the mighty Queen Victoria. Osborne was the toys that Grandpapa and Papa in his turn had played with. Osborne was musical boxes and porridge for breakfast and the house of Her Majesty the Queen. Osborne was crowded with animals. All the horses and dogs and lesser creatures the royal family had cherished hung immortalized from floor to ceiling in paint, in plaster and in wood. The spirits of innumerable deer dwelt in the furniture of one whole room. Here, the young prince took tea on orders with great-grandmama. It was an ordeal. The slightest rustle of her black satin skirts whispered her great age and her immense authority. To a child, she was a somber presence. But in the grounds of Osborne, the children were allowed a fort equipped to withstand the stoutest siege by officious adults. The fort was a fine and private place where a man could perfect the stern arts of war. Prince Edward had the gun. Brother Albert gave the commands, and Sister Mary followed. Sometimes great-grandmama would invite the young Prince Edward to join her on a promenade of the grounds. It was a decorous way to take the air. The pace was Victorian, steady, majestic, safe. The villa itself was a treasure house. In the Durbar room glinted and sparkled rubies and diamonds and emeralds and pearls, pale jade and ivory. Sword, shields, and lances sent as tribute to the Empress. There were peacock silks, heavy silver boxes, all gifts of the Rajas and the Indian princes who owed allegiance to the British crown. A small boy could wander in a dream through the mystery and treasures of the East. By the end of Victoria's reign, Osborne had become a place of pilgrimage for the crowned heads of Europe. There were 20 monarchs still firmly on their thrones in Europe. All but two of them, Victoria's relatives by birth or marriage. Her own family was a large one, nine children, 40 grandchildren, numerous great-grandchildren, an entire nation of lesser kindred. But at last, the flowering was over. In 1901, the old queen died. It seemed incredible that so proud a heart could stop. Victoria had reigned for 64 years. She had won the love of her people. She had done her duty. She had become a symbol of security and peace and order. And with her death came change. The Queen's body was taken in solemn state from Osborne to Windsor, to St. George's Chapel, the place of rest for England's kings and queens. piercing cold, the interminable wait, and feeling very lost among scores of sorrowing relatives. 
solemn princes in varied uniforms and princesses sobbing behind heavy crepe veils. The queen was laid to rest beside her beloved Albert in the mausoleum she herself had designed. She had set the standard by which all future monarchs would be judged. Queen Victoria is a constitutional monarch. It's like Queen Elizabeth is a constitutional monarch today. Uh, I think because she reigned for so long, she ha had a, a, an exceptional amount of, of, of influence. She certainly was a, a great queen, and when she died, it was a, an era past the turn of the century, 1901. Who comes there? The key. Whose key? King Edward's key. Advance, King Edward's keys. All's well. Escort the key. By the centre. Quick mark. The Queen is dead. Long live the King. Edward VII, the peacemaker. The Prince's grandfather was now King Edward VII, his father, heir to the throne. The family moved to Frogmore on the banks of the Thames, near Windsor Castle. The house had no electricity, but it did have boats, and one of them a royal barge. Windsor Castle itself was a paradise for a young boy. It was a warren of chambers, staircases, corridors and turrets and mysterious doors. In the east wing were the royal apartments, the white, green and crimson drawing rooms, the king's drawing room, the king's bedroom. The roof was a child's dream kingdom, but it was forbidden ground. To the children, that made it even more desirable. You could see for miles from up there. A Saxon fort rose first at Windsor. The Normans strengthened it, and for 900 years it stood a bastion and a seat of kings. 37 English sovereigns had been sheltered by its thick stone walls. They found diversion on its pleasant lawns. On the golf course, in the castle grounds, I used to look forward to caddying for my father at a shilling a round, though he never allowed us children to play. If we let those boys on the fairway, they'll only hack it up. Consequently, to this day, I feel that my swing leaves much to be desired. In London, the prince's family now lived in Marlborough House. Some mornings, the children formed line behind Forsyth, the piper, to greet the day and their father with the clamor of the pipes. <laughs> Some mornings, their tutor allowed the children to leave the schoolroom to watch the changing of the guard. They were as enthralled as the rest. Since my day, the sentries have been removed behind the railings of Buckingham Palace because of the over-enthusiastic behavior of some members of the public. So now the police guard the sentries, or the sentries guard the Queen. But in spite of the pageantry, Buckingham Palace had its drawbacks. I didn't like Buckingham Palace. It was very drafty. Somehow, I had a feeling that I might not be there very long. I never got over the feeling of not quite belonging there. I felt lost 
in its regal immensity. In his early teens, the prince spent much of his time with his grandfather, the king, at Sandringham, where the partridge and pheasant shooting were famous. The king was a sturdy shot, but the prince's father was better, one of the finest in Europe. As a special favor, the young prince was sometimes allowed to join them. began now to prepare for his entrance examination to the Navy. For the British royal family, life at sea has often been the traditional schoolroom. His father said the Navy would teach him all he needs to know. In 1907, I went to the Royal Naval College at Osborne. The main part of the college was built of Queen Victoria's old stables at Osborne House. There were 12 dormitories, 35 cadets in each, and it was quite a tough life for boys of 13 to 15. And uh, after two years at Osborne, we moved to Dartmouth, Devon. And uh, the, th that's where the, the, the Naval College had always been in the old battleship Britannia. My father was a naval cadet there. And uh, the early part of this century, they uh, moved the cadets, it was not very, not very comfortable, that ship, and they built this large, very fine-looking building, as a matter of fact, the college at Dartmouth. And I spent two years there. It was quite a strenuous time, and uh, discipline was very strict. But come! But look! step up from Osborne to Dartmouth was the start of a boy's career in the Navy. The college loomed over the River Dart and the open sea beyond. Generations of naval officers had learned their craft in its classrooms, later to put it to the test in their country's sea fights far across the world. Everything at Dartmouth happened at double the normal speed. Although the prince dared not actually complain, he did once write home that life went on in an awful rush. His mother wrote back. I hope that in time you will get accustomed to the rush, which I believe is rather trying. Do tell me whether you have time to clean your teeth at night. This is so important and I want to know. Don't forget to answer this question. In May 1910, the prince was on leave at Marlborough House, close to Buckingham Palace. Early one morning, he was wakened suddenly by his brother. Look, all the flags at half-mast. The nine-year reign of their grandfather had ended. King Edward VII was dead. Their father now was king. King Edward's body was borne from London to Windsor for burial. Wearing their uniforms as naval cadets, the young Prince Edward, now heir apparent, and his brother Albert, second in succession to the throne, followed behind the coffin on its gun carriage, paced by the muffled drums, the cortege included nine reigning monarchs bound by ties of blood to the British throne. The Kaiser of Germany, Wilhelm II, a grandson of Queen Victoria, in the uniform of a British field marshal. The kings of Spain and Denmark, of Portugal, Greece, Belgium, and Norway. The Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. The Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich of Russia. Some of these crowns, now so secure, would soon be swept from their owners' heads by global war. The silken standards of the Knights of the Garter hung motionless as the king was laid to rest in the vault of St. George's Chapel. The king is dead. Long live the king. Key. 
Who's key? King George's key. Advance King George's key. All well. A month later, the prince's father was to be crowned King George V in Westminster Abbey. All the elaborate ceremonial of a coronation must be rehearsed. All the trappings of majesty prepared. The gold state coach, carved and embellished with Italian panels 200 years old, must be made ready in the royal news. The coronation of George V took place on June 22nd, 1911. Exciting day, even for a young prince, as he noted in his diary. I breakfasted early and saw Mama and Papa at nine. Then, dressed in my garter clothes and robe, left in a state carriage at ten with Mary and the brothers. We arrived at the abbey at 10.30, and I walked up the nave and choir to my seat in front of the peers. All the relatives were most civil and bowed to me as I passed. Then Mama and Papa arrived and the ceremony commenced. After the recognition, the anointing and the crowning, I put on my coronet with the peers and had to do homage to Papa at his throne. And I was very nervous. I, Edward, Prince of Wales, to become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. And faith and truth I will bear unto you, to live and to die against all manner of folk. So help me God. Prince Edward rose to touch his father's crown. The king kissed him on the cheek, the gentle kiss of a father for his son. But on that day, before that throne, the weight of sovereignty began to fall upon a carefree boy. Then came respite, the prince's first sea duty aboard the coal-burning battleship Hindustan, three months as a midshipman. I enjoyed the experience immensely and even looked forward to the dirty, back-breaking job of coaling ship. For the cigarettes I was allowed to smoke on those occasions, I was taught to read flag signals by the chief yeoman. I served in a gun turret during battle practice. I learned how to run a picket boat and kept watch at sea. He also learned the art of living among men of different stamp and a different calling. But inevitably, there were other plans for him, plans for a broader education. And soon the prince left Dartmouth and the Navy. Years later, full of nostalgia, he returned to Dartmouth to inspect the cadets, this time in the uniform of an admiral. London at the age of 15, the prince performed his first public ceremony. I felt like an actor making his debut, but I managed to play my part in spite of my nervousness. 
physically, it was not an exhausting task. Now, in Wales, Prince Edward was invested Prince of Wales at Carnarvon Castle. Lloyd George, with his very vivid imagination, thought it was a ceremony that would please the Welsh people. I don't believe there had been an investiture there for some centuries. It was a very warm day, I remember. I was dressed up in a costume I disliked intensely. I thought that if maybe I'd just come out of the Navy and I thought, what will my buddies think of with this? Then I had a little crown on, this terrible costume. I was very self-conscious and happy. My mother said, You mustn't take a mere ceremony so seriously. Your friends will understand that as a prince, you are obliged to do certain things that may seem a little silly. It will only be for this once. Winston Churchill, who was Home Secretary at the time, had to proclaim my titles. He told me afterwards that he had memorized them on the golf course. My father presented me to the Welsh people. Lloyd George had taught me a few words of Welsh, some of which I still remember. Morogan, you Cymru i gyd, which means all Wales is a land of song. 1912, the prince went up to Oxford to join 4,000 other undergraduates. He was given rooms in Maudlin and the college president received him in the quadrangle suspected that the good president's interest in the prince was not wholly academic. Whenever he beamed upon me, I was never quite certain whether it was with a teacher's benevolence or from a collector's secret satisfaction with a coveted trophy. In any case, he struck us all as being somewhat of a snob. Friends suggested that because of tourists and reporters, I shouldn't be seen near the college deer park till all the publicity of my arrival had died down. The local guides had spread the story that the park had been restocked to enable me to do a little shooting when my studies palled. In fact, studies did pall. The prince still longed for a life at sea. The river's call was stronger than the library's. His report read, Bookish he will never be. But all the time he is learning more and more every day of men, gauging character, getting to know what Englishmen are like, both individually and still more in the man. And on the open road, the prince got his first car at Oxford. And at Oxford, he put on a soldier's uniform for the first time. Across Europe, the prince's kin were doing the same. In different uniforms of different colors, Queen Victoria's descendants, the crowned heads of Europe, were about to divide, confront one another, and meet in the shock of war. I was at Oxford when the First World War started. Then I joined the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards. After 10 days of training in Essex, we were moved to London and quartered at Wellington Barracks. I found battalion training was hard work. The first time I went on King's Guard, I was ensign and had to carry the color. I was surprised at its weight. When my unit went overseas, I was not allowed to go. And I went to see Lord Kitchener uh, to complain of this and, and express to him my better disappointment. And I added, it doesn't matter if I am killed, because I have four brothers. Lord Kitchener replied, I don't mind about your being killed, but I do not want you to be taken prisoner and held as a hostage. While others can respond to Kitchener's appeal, your country needs you, the heir to the throne must be kept out of danger. The prince had to content himself with peaceful duties. He joined his mother and other members of the royal family on tours of factories and hospitals and shipyards. It was hard work and long hours. It boosted morale. But to the prince, it was not war. He wanted to fight. He said in a letter, I do feel such a swine sitting back here in England, merely hearing news without seeing anything at all. It fairly makes me sick, as you can well imagine, particularly as I am young and fit. If I was unfit, 
I shouldn't mind so much. At last, his pleas were heard and he was sent to France to join the staff of the Guards Division. But still, he was not satisfied. Again and again, he wrote home, asking permission to move forward to the fighting lines. Finally, he was attached to the 2nd Division's headquarters at Bethune. It was still not the trenches, but at least he could hear the guns. He wrote to his father. I'm delighted to think that I may now go to the trenches and in shell areas as any staff officer would. It is dear and kind of you to give me permission to go to the fighting on duty. On an inspection tour of the front, the Prince's car became tangled with a convoy of monsters. It was his first sight of the weapon designed to break the stalemate of trench warfare, the still secret tank. The Prince described this in a letter to his father. The land submarine is a heavily armored car propelled by a 120 horsepower engine, which drives two endless chains in which the car moves at a speed of two miles an hour. The armor is proof against anything but a direct hit from a shell. The type of land vessel is so constructed as to surmount any form of obstacle that would be met in assaulting enemy positions in conjunction with the infantry. Like others, the Prince was far from certain that the tanks could win the war. But at least they offered a chance. They were one of the first things my father wanted to see when he came to France with my brother, Albert. We toured the battle zone, visiting units in the front line. Wherever they went, they raised morale. The Prince conducted the tour himself, proud of his military knowledge, proud to be with his fighting men, proud to be doing his duty, and appalled at the slaughter. 1950. 1960. 1970. Then, in that year, new hope. The Americans arrived, young, strong, unmarked by years of sacrifice, confident of victory, but green. Took time to build up strength to gain battle experience. And time helped the enemy. In Russia, Lenin preached communism to the peasants and washed away the throne of Russia in violent revolution. The Tsar Nicholas, the king's cousin, and his family were slaughtered in the night in a cellar. A dynasty had ended in a nightmare. In France, decorating French heroes, the prince refused to wear his own medals. His father wrote, it is very silly of you not to wear the ribbons of the Russian and French orders that were given to you. The prince wrote back. I think you know how distasteful it is to me to wear these two war decorations, having never done any fighting and having always been kept well out of danger. I feel so ashamed to wear medals which I only have because of my position, when there are so many thousands of gallant men who lead a terrible existence in the trenches and who have been in battles of the fiercest kind who have not been decorated. No doubt I look at this question from a wrong and foolish point of view, but this is the view I take. It was the view of a sensitive and feeling man, sickened by the brute reality of war, made impatient of empty ceremony. And then, it was all over. The killing had ended. Millions had died, more than the mind could grasp. Now was the time for mourning. A pretty clear idea of what was expected of me as Prince of Wales was that I should step without delay into the customary duties devolving upon that office. In short, I was required to show myself to the people in order to make my character known and at the same time to fill the Prince of Wales's traditional role. Perhaps one of the only positive pieces of advice that I was ever given was that supplied by an old courtier. Never miss a chance to sit down and rest your feet, and never miss an opportunity to relieve yourself. My father's advice was, you have had a much freer life than I ever knew. The war has made it possible for you to mix with all manner of people 
in a way I was never able to do. But don't think that this means that you can now act like other people. You must always remember your position and who you are. In August 1919, the prince's duties took him overseas. With his father and mother, the king and queen, there to wave goodbye, he boarded the battle cruiser HMS Renown at Portsmouth. It had been the prime minister, Lloyd George's idea to make of the prince a royal ambassador. The war had shaken even the strong ties of the British Commonwealth, and the prince could mend them. He could thank his father's people across the seas, and he could mix with them as their prince and future king. And so he sailed westward for Canada and friendly America. The prince first sighted the New World from the armored deck of the Renown before he stepped ashore in St. John's, Newfoundland, the earliest colony of the British Empire. In this new brawling, growing country, the formal bow and the formal word belong to the past. Everyone was so anxious to shake my hand, I decided it would be ungracious to refuse. This rash decision must have been based on the fallacious idea that Canada was sparsely populated. Either that, or I failed to appreciate what a feeble instrument the right hand really is. It all started with a man in the crowd thrusting his hand towards me with the words, Put it there, Ed. I shook hands with your granddad. My right hand was so much in use, it became blackened and swollen, and extremely painful from the constant battering it received. On the advice of my doctor, I was forced to retire it temporarily from imperial service. My mother wrote me, I feel angry at the amount of handshaking and autograph writing you seem compelled to face. In one place, I see you had to give your left hand as the right was so swollen. Though no doubt the people mean it well, and the receptions you are having must be overwhelming. Put it there, Ed. I shook hands with your granddad. That was to become the pattern wherever I went. New Zealand, Australia, Africa, Japan, the United States, South America. Always the hands reaching, demanding, always the crush of people, always roads to be opened, trees to be planted, cornerstones to be laid, ceremonies, demands, duties. If all the trees I planted and all the cornerstones I laid were put together, they would make a substantial forest in a sizable city. His father advised him, You might take things easier during the last month of your visit and give yourself more time and more rest from the everlasting functions and speeches which get on one's nerves. I warned you what it would be like. These people think one is made of stone and that one could go on forever. You ought to have put your foot down at the beginning and refused to do so much. If Canada's welcome was boisterous, in the land of liberty it was louder still. All the ships in New York's harbor let loose at once when the Prince arrived. When I got back home, I told my father about prohibition. He didn't like the idea at all. He thought it an outrage that any government should try to forbid its citizens a drink if they wanted one. So he was delighted when I recited a verse I picked up on the Canadian border. Four and twenty Yankees, feeling very dry, went across the border to get a drink of rye. When the rye was open, the Yanks began to sing, God bless America, but God save the king.
yapıyor.